Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will revisit Pavlovian conditioning a bit, and in particular, we will ask how it starts. This is an advanced lesson, based on a paper I published with Magnus Enquist in 2019. I have included it in the course to give an example of contemporary research on learning. What I will say is in part my personal opinion. Most researchers will agree that what I will show is interesting, but will not necessarily agree with my interpretation. We are going to look at the very first phases of Pavlovian conditioning and try to understand exactly when an animal's memory is updated with new information. The standard view here is that memory is updated every time the animal perceives a CS, followed by a US. For example, we typically describe Pavlov's experiment by saying that there is a sequence of bell food experiences, bell food, bell food, bell food, and so on. And we say that the dog learns based on these experiences. Most theories of conditioning take the same assumption. For example, the Roscoe Wagner model updates the associative strength V any time a CS-US experience occurs. What does not matter, according to the standard view, is whether a CR, a response, is performed or not during the CS-US experience. For example, we think that the dog learns from a bell food experience even if during that experience it does not salivate. Let's look at some data to see why this might not be the case. We saw in previous lessons that the Roscoe and Wagner model is a good match to Pavlovian learning curves. Let's see another example. We look at an eye blink conditioning experiment with rabbits by Thayos and Brailsford, but similar results can be found in other studies. The top image in this graph shows the percentage of rabbits that blinked on any given trial during this experiment. This was a large study with nearly 100 rabbits, so we can see a smooth increase in overall blinking, sometimes 20 rabbits blink, sometimes 25, sometimes 30, and so on. The line is the best fit provided by the Roscoe Wagner model, which, as you see, is pretty good. The bottom image shows what some of the rabbits did over the 150 trials of the experiment. The bars indicate trials with an eye blink. What's striking to see is that some rabbits started to blink right away to the sound that was used as a CS, while other rabbits did not respond until 50 or even 80 trials into the experiment. It also seems that the learning phase is often short. Once a rabbit starts blinking to the CS, it quickly reaches a steady frequency of blinking. This looks different from the gradual increase in responding that we typically expect from RW. What I just said is not a proof that R. Dunkley is not a good theory of learning, but it suggests that it can be improved. For example, here are some simulations of the RW models for individual rabbits. As you can see, this is simulated rabbits that precisely conform to the RW model do not really look like the empirical records that we see in the Sayus and Brelfos experiment. Most of the RW rabbits, so to speak, start responding pretty early and they increase their responding gradually. In other words, the RW rabbits mimic at the individual level what we saw at the group level. There are a few things that we can try to improve RW. For example, it may be unrealistic to think that all rabbits learn at the same speed. Maybe some rabbits start to respond later because they take longer to notice the connection between CS and US. In RW, this would mean that these rabbits have a low learning rate alpha. Another possibility is that some rabbits respond more easily than others, given that they have learned the same. For example, an eager rabbit might respond already when the associative strength is 0.1, say, while another might need to have learned an associative strength of 0.5 to start responding. We tried to change RW in these ways in our paper, but we did not find that the fit to the actual data improved much. For example, it is possible that the rabbit blinks on trial 5 and then doesn't blink a second time until trial 20 or so on. I won't go into too many details here, but these gaps are difficult to explain with the original RW model or with the two modifications just described. What worked best is a different modification of RW where animals do not learn at every CSUS experience. Let's see how we can understand this. The change is actually pretty simple. The top formula here is the RW learning formula that says that learning is proportional to error. It has been covered in previous lessons and it should be familiar by now. The modified RW model is very similar. 
by the associative strength V is not updated every time. Instead, it is updated only when the animal actually responds. Mathematically, we just multiply the RW formula by new variable R, which is zero when the animal does not respond and one when it responds. This has the effect that there is no change in associative strength unless the animal responds. I'd like to stress that the revised model is still based on the idea that learning is proportional to error. We have seen that this idea works well in many cases, so we don't want to just throw it out of the window. Instead, we are trying to fix the model with a small change. To see if the revised model works better, let's look again at the rabbit data. This graph is about one particular rabbit, and the bars at the top show when this rabbit responded. The first response was at trial 40. The black line is the best fit of RW to the data. In contrast to the line that I showed earlier, which referred to the whole group of rabbits, this time I tuned RW to be the best possible description of this particular rabbit. We can see now what the puzzle is. After trial 40, the rabbit goes pretty quickly from not responding to responding almost every time. This means that the rabbit is learning quickly at this point. But if it is learning quickly, why did it wait until trial 40 to respond? The black line shows that RW predicts a large probability of responding up to 40% for each trial, even before the rabbit starts responding, so when there are actually no responses. The red line shows how the modified model solves the problem. In this model, the associative strength only changes when there is a response. With this idea, it makes more sense that the rabbit can learn quickly after trial 40, but do not respond at all before that because the trials without a response would not increase associative strength. We can see that in the red line, because the red line is flat here, it's flat here, it's flat here, it's flat any time there is a trial without a response. That means on those trials, the response probability is not increasing. You can repeat the same exercise with all rabbits, and you find out that the modified model is either better than the original RW, or equally good at least. In conclusion, we have seen that looking at how animals learn individually may tell a bit of a different story than looking at how they learn on average as a group. We have also seen that the original RW model has some trouble explaining how individuals learn, but also that this might be possible to fix with a relatively small change to the model. As I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, most experimental psychologists agree that the data I showed you are interesting, but they will not necessarily agree with the fix. If you want to know more about the topic, you can read the reference here on this slide. For the course, you can continue with the lesson on conditioned reinforcement, learning values, and learning action sequences. This lesson is over. Happy learning to everyone.